May I now invite uh, Mr. V.P. Agarwal and uh, Lieutenant Commander Jaspir Singh Solanki. I'm told that the sessions have been swapped. So, uh, Mr. Muzaffar Ahmed, sir, uh, please forgive me. Yours is the next one. Um, uh, please come on to the stage. Uh, Mr. V.P. Agarwal is the current chairman of the Airport Authority of India with effect from, oh, from 1st January 2009. He also holds a master's degree in engineering and a bachelor's degree in engineering from IIT Roorkee, uh, has had many distinctions to his credit. His bio is in this booklet. And we have Lieutenant Commander Jaspir Singh Solanki, former Indian Navy officer, again, a qualified engineer and an MBA from the Bajaj Institute in Mumbai. And currently, he is um, uh, with the Critical Infrastructure Group of Mahinda Special Services. So you'll both get 15 minutes each and uh, kindly stay with time. Thanks, Mr. Raja. <clears throat> Dr. Mr. Pillai has spoken about uh, the overall scenario in India, what we are uh, going through on the security front. I'd like to concentrate uh, uh, what has been happening on infrastructure which we are trying to build and what uh, uh, precautions and uh, protective measures we are taking at uh, our critical infrastructures. Uh, we have been wit witnessing a very uh, I'll say a solid growth uh, consistently uh, between seven to uh, uh, consistently we have been facing a, a good growth and we have been projecting a good growth uh, in the next uh, 12 five year plan uh, which was initially envisaged at uh, nine to nine point five percent which was uh, later on uh, toned down a little bit uh, eight to eight point five percent even that growth rate uh, demands a huge investment on the infrastructure uh, if it uh, translates into the investment required uh, for 12 five year plan uh, we dream that uh, something like 1 trillion dollars will be spent on indian infra infrastructure naturally it is a huge investment and we'd like to protect these investment for the future of the country and uh, uh, we'll be uh, uh, safeguarding these infrastructures and uh, we literally have to spend something on the security for these infrastructures. Security per se doesn't contribute on the real productivity part of it. Uh, it may be uh, 2 to 3 percent initially cost of the project, but uh, as a recurring maintenance goes and the subsequent period, it becomes quite high. So we are concerned, but still it is unavoidable investment in the future and uh, safeguarding the economy. Uh, there are certain critical infrastructure uh, which are, uh, uh, which are uh, exposed to such security threats, which are immediately, uh, that is, uh, these particular infrastructure can be damaged, uh, incapacitated, or made ineffective. Uh, but there may be certain infrastructure which have chain reactions. Attacks on physical infrastructure uh, involvement could be from a terrorist attack or a plantation of a bomb, while in case of uh, cyber attacks, which are very critical and it has a multiplier effect, it can be done remotely and which is uh, very sensitive. And uh, it is also becoming a very uh, sophisticated way of attacking infrastructure because uh, you can take command of the system and then you can mislead the, uh, give the wrong information in the system or uh, you can mislead the whole thing. The, our infrastructure, all vast infrastructure having great uh, investments like uh, whether it is a power grid, water supply installation, dams, nuclear installation, offshore exploration, all these are exposed for uh, security threat and uh, we have to safeguard uh, these installations to protect our future. Um, Cyber attacks is a uh, very uh, critical uh, from our civilization point of view. I'll dwell on that, that how, we are go uh, how we are protecting ourselves from these type of attacks on us. Uh, the aviation sector, which is very critical for any country, has a 
a multi-dimensional effect on the economy. Number one, it is itself an infrastructure. Number two, be concerned about certain attack, uh, certain airports which are really totally unmanned. These unmanned airports which are uh, dormant, not in use, but still there is an airstrip which can be used uh, by terrorists at some situations. So even that is a cause of concern. And even the airports which have a lower level of security can uh, allow uh, infiltration to attack uh, to a terrorist and he can sneak in at that uh, low lead, uh, I'll say uh, a particular uh, airport having a low security uh, rings, he can penetrate from there and then uh, make uh, his plan to attack any major airport. So this is a very sensitive thing. So probably each airport where operation occurs, we have to safeguard nothing sneaks in. We have uh, provisions, regulatory provisions, for safeguarding the life of the passengers and life of our properties. Those enablers are there with us. That uh, regulatory provisions are there. We have uh, uh, sufficient provisions. Uh, government has set up a uh, regulatory authority within uh, uh, Civil Aviation Ministry, that is BCS, 25 years back. So this has been making various uh, schemes, proposals, regulations to be used for civil aviation purpose, and uh, which we are uh, complying and using. And uh, uh, after this uh, Kandhar hijack, uh, CISF was mandated to be inducted at all the airports because uh, local police force was not found to be that uh, well-trained and adequately equipped to handle those situations. We are also planning, of, uh, planning to migrate to having our own security force in future. Probably the idea is because CISF is a force protecting other industrial installations, while our installations are very different. Because we are concerned for person I mean, who brings something in the airport. We are not concerned somebody taking out of the airport. CISF is basically trained that nothing goes out of an installation while we are concerned that nothing comes in the installation. So there is a uh, mindset difference. And we have to uh, uh, have a force which is uh, very much uh, trained for aviation purpose. And again, we have a very, uh, uh, our passengers are high profile uh, people. And they're very sensitive about uh, the way uh, uh, CSF personnel deal them. So if it is uh, dealt in a regular uh, police fashion, then sometimes they complain. There have been a lot of uh, complaints from MPs, uh, the way CISF ha handled them. Because I mean, uh, think of a Jawan who is at a duty, he, he will not know who he is. So sometimes he does the frisking, and then again, uh, that particular MP feels offended. And uh, there is a lot of drama, I guess. So somehow, I mean, we have to do a balance out of it. Uh, we have been. Uh, I mean, uh, we have been advised to train CISF people on such positions to uh, do that frisking with a smile and uh, be firm in case he becomes doubtful about certain things. Uh, we have been gauging, constantly monitoring various threats which occur. Unfortunately, because of the uh, uh, unfriendly um, neighbors, I'll say, constantly there is a constant threat from uh, one neighboring country or the other uh, country. So there is always a, a persistence uh, baseline threat at most of the airports. Then we have another uh, situation where uh, uh, some uh, threat level is raised, that is intermediate. Some uh, local situation has got disturbed and there is a threat is raised. And in such uh, some situations, there is always very high because those are uh, uh, targeted airports and uh, uh, every time that is high on agenda of the terrorists, I mean, they want to speak from that particular airport or do damage from that particular airport. So in any case, we have graded those airports and we have uh, graded our protection accordingly. The airports have been accordingly categorized and we have been uh, uh, having additional measures at those hypersensitive airports so uh, that uh, um, no, uh, nothing sensitive uh, or nothing objectionable is passed through. Uh, we as airport operator are supposed to have the uh, total security of the airport parameters within airport area. 
and then uh, local police becomes responsible for uh, beyond the airport boundaries. We always have the information share, intelligence uh, sharing, and then ultimately it is airline which has to uh, see that uh, nothing is sneaks in, in the aircraft. Uh, we have been upgrading all over our uh, equipment uh, for the purpose at the airports, uh, which is causing a lot of inconvenience to the people. And there have been a lot of debate on uh, such type of equipments to be used. Uh, we have been having, uh, 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 we have been uh, trying to detect uh, anything uh, taken on body, and uh, any explosives also we are detecting. And uh, so far, there have been a debate on body scanners which practically gives very foolproof uh, indication of anything, uh, the hidden parts. But somehow uh, uh, that has a, uh, uh, limitations and uh, people do object in India, so that we are not able to move in. Yes, yes, great. Uh, we have taken various measures at the airport, so that is safe, sufficiently safeguarded. Uh, uh, even, I mean, we have taken all the precautions, it's still there are chances that uh, something untoward happens. So we must have a gauged uh, response to those uh, actions. So we have committees at various levels, aerodrome level, central level, and then uh, uh, secretariat level and uh, cabinet committee on security. So all these four levels, there are committees, and depending upon uh, uh, I'll say um, uh, uh, criticality of the situation, the uh, decision is taken and uh, we deal with it. And uh, I feel we uh, on the airports, uh, uh, on aviation uh, sector are uh, taking a reasonable measures to safeguard that uh, we survive in the hostile situation all around and still keep our installation secure and we don't become potential threat to any of the installation. And uh, uh, we, uh, do sufficient to safeguard that uh, we remain on the right path, but of course, the expenditure on security is again, I'll say, is uh, unproductive expenditure. It doesn't, uh, we don't get any, gain anything, but I feel it is unavoidable one, and we have to continue with that for sufficient time. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have got 10 minutes, and I'll close within that time limit, sir. I have a humble request. I don't like speaking to the empty chairs, so can I request the last row, please, to move, shift, if you don't mind? It's a very humble request. Speaking on increasing risk in Indian critical infrastructure. Three points, basically, what is the India's risk map in 2012? How the risk and challenges are existing in critical infrastructure, especially, you know, related to India. Case study on oil and gas sector, which we implemented, and it's a very leading approach which has been followed in security industry. This map looks very beautiful, and if you see, India is on a very medium risk here, because this is the political risk map. We have a very political stable party. But if you see on the northwest region, starting from Pakistan till Syria, it's all red. And the Somalia, which is you know, down there on Africa side, is also totally red, which is you know, rated highest on the terrorism index list. There was a study carried out, and 160 countries were you know, included in the study. 24 global risks were seen in it. And if you see on the top list there, India is next to Afghanistan and Pakistan in this list. Coming to the terrorism index, global perspective. In 2010, we were ranked 6. In 2011, we are ranked 16. So we are improving, so that's a good news. And hopefully, going forward, we'll have less of terrorism in our country. How does the regional instability exist in our country? If you see, Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh around us. Afghanistan is at war. Pakistan, we don't know who's ruling that country. Whether the politicians are ruling it, is the army ruling it, or is somebody else who's ruling it. 
China is playing strategic role in its investment in Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan. They are building ports, and we need to seriously look into that threat. Bangladesh is becoming a very, very, very serious affair for us, a critical uh, country to be looked into. To just give you an example, and recent incidents are happening. In naval officers' area in Bombay, where officer lives, they are allowed to keep the domestic help. 70 to 80 percent of domestic help is from Bangladesh. So imagine if some of the guys from there have a relationship with Taliban or somebody else, terrorist uh, organization, they can plant bomb inside that residential area. Half of the Navy senior officers or officers will go off. What are the key drivers for risk in this world? There are two areas which critically comes out is the economical disparity and the governance failures. This has been identified around the world. The various governments are failing and because of which the terrorism organized crime is increasing day by day. Coming to the risk and challenges for critical infrastructure protection in India. Today we all know it's a very well connected and we have discussed this during this conference. The one sector depends on the other sector. So if an attack on one sector happens, definitely there'll be you know, impact on the other sectors. We are in a power conference, and this is the list which I have got it from the net yesterday. So there are 170 power plants, different categories, eight nuclear, coal 103, gas 30, and hydro 29. So they're all spread uniformly in India. We need to have a strategy, a security strategy not at the organization level, but at the national level also protecting all these power plants. Why somebody will attack a power plant? It's easy to disrupt, and the question was asked today. They'll have a widespread damage. It's difficult to recover, and it'll grab media attention. You can see this is the latest news, which was there in Mumbai Mirror on 29 July. The, the Mumbai police carried out a dummy exercise or to, just to test how Tata Power is prepared for any terrorist attack, or can anybody enter the Tata Power or the RCA plant? I'm sure this would be the state for most of the plants in India. And we encourage this kind of exercise actually gives you an acid test that what is the real security measures, countermeasures put at the organization level. Just to give you a perspective why, why it is important that Tata Power that this whole area is very strategic. There's a bath there, there's BPCL refinery, there's HPCL. So it's very attractive and there are a lot of intelligence input has been given to those companies again and again to, be, to protect themselves. Another attractive area I just want to highlight uh, to the gathering here is the Gulf of Kutch. If you understand, this is where the oil hub of India is there. The most of the oil which goes to the refinery, whether it's in Jamnagar or it's in Bina, Batinda, BPCL, HPCL, or IOCL, comes through this route. So there are single point of moorings from where the tankers unload their crude. And if anything happens on those single point of mooring, the cost or, or the time take to manufacture the mooring is six months. So you can imagine the complete destruction can happen in the oil sector in India. There could be so many thousands of these attractive area across India. We need to identify, I'm hopeful government would be looking into it, but with a very different strategy altogether. Just highlighting the terror attacks which have happened on India, Delhi and Mumbai are on top list. My question here is, or what I'm trying to say is, will, will there be any other terror attack which will happen on a hotel? I don't see the possibility is very less because they have attacked one hotel, they have got the media attention. We have made a lot of investment in hotels now and it's good, the security has gone up. But we should be thinking what next those terrorists would be thinking in their mind. The next attack would be on Taj Mahal. So when the attack will happen, then we'll start planning or are we planning in advance? That's the big question and we, we need to address that. Another report from the media, the ammonium nitrate is very easily available and which was used in blast in Mumbai and Delhi. Nexalism is another problem in India and we need to control it. It should not happen like in Pakistan, what Taliban role is playing today, the nexalism should not go that way. We have lost almost 11,000 lives from 2005 onwards. 
Cyber crime, we have already, you know, in the last session, we come to know about it, and it's growing, and it's exponentially growing. We need to prepare ourselves, we need to prepare our organization, government, to counter this. And government has taken an initiative, uh, NTRO is going to set up that cyber warfare. Another area where, uh, related to the critical infrastructure, you need to be worried about in day-to-day -day life is the workplace violence. This is very prominent in U.S. and it is coming here, not in the same shape or form. The strikes which have happened in Maruti and other places are very dangerous and organizations need to take care of those. What are the challenges implementing a integrated security systems for our critical infrastructure? These are four photographs. If some of you can identify in first photograph what is they are doing wrong. And this has been highlighted in the previous session also. There's a security personnel using metal detector to identify a bomb on rail track. It is just going to detect metal. It can't detect explosive. Those, the, what point I'm trying to make, there's a huge gap between the training of these people, what they are supposed to know and how to handle this technology. We can't use technology just like that. The, another area is picture two, where the scanners, X-ray scanners are used at the railway stations. I have not seen this anywhere else in the world. You know, how can, you can't apply the airport approach to the railway stations. They, they check your, you know, check-in baggage and different line scanners inside the airport, and they just check your hand baggage. In railway station, it's a big challenge. You can just protect Delhi, uh, Delhi railway station, but somebody boards a train at Faridabad, comes to Delhi, does a bomb blast. It's a sheer wastage of money. You're just getting perception that you're more secure but eventually you are not coming out with a strong strategy. The third photograph is about a Delhi city surveillance project. It is fitted in Sadar Bajar, and you can clearly see the camera can't look at this view is obstructed by a pole there, whereas the right installation is shown in the picture four. The challenge in India is always between manpower and technology. It's all about 3G in India, you know, guard, guns, and gates. Put more guards, put, give them more guns, put more gates, and you feel you are more secure. That's no more is the case. The technology has changed. We have to improve ourselves. There's high rate of attrition in this industry. It's growing very fast, so we need to keep pace with it. Coming to the technology part, which is very important, and it is very difficult for us to understand that, it is a vendor-driven market today. People sell cameras. They are not selling the whole technology or the complete solution. So there's a big challenge in this. There's a quality issue. A lot of Chinese products are being pushed in India. Those people will sell their cameras and they'll go away, we'll waste our money. We need to seriously look into this area. The last. This news came in papers and there was a Intelligence, the terror attack will happen on the Reliance refinery and Batinda refinery at HML refinery. So they are very serious target. And why I'm talking about this is this organization has put in best of the technology with a you know, very scientific approach. So there's a refinery which is spread in 2,000 acres. There's a 1,000 kilometer pipeline. There's a port where crude is stored. And they wanted to secure all this infrastructure. It's a $4 billion investment. So how, how did they go about doing it? They did the first thing is the risk assessment. What are the threats in that area for their research? How to protect them? They, go, they went through the scientific approach, identify for which threat they need to put the technological control or people control or the process controls. So they came out with an integrated approach towards the whole security scenario. That how many number of people do they need? what kind of technology is suitable for them, and what kind of standard operating procedure they need to put in place. Just to give you an example, and this will elaborate actually for, for your own understanding, on your right-hand side or on your left-hand side, you'll see all the sensors, the technology which is available if you want to have an integrated security approach, which can be your access control, video surveillance, you know, panic button, GPS, GRS locations. So what happens in a normal case? You know, all these sensors give inputs to, to the various operators who are sitting in the control rooms. And it's an overload of information comes to them. Now, then these operators start sending this inputs to the various responders, 
first responders can be police, their own QRT teams, or you know, any hospitals, or stakeholders who are their management stakeholders. It is a very inefficient way of you know, sending the response to these people. In a situational management kind of a design, what you need to do is integrate all these sensors, come to a single platform, and then the correlation engines run on them. So you put a lot of analytics on it, that excess control is, you know, alarm has come, so take the video from there also, is the person you know who is intruding inside your facility. Then you give the required input to the respective operators. So what does the operator get? He gets to see what's happening through the video feed. Okay, where is it happening? So he'll have the location map that, okay, intrusion is happening in this part of the refinery. The most important thing is he gets standard operating procedure in front of him. What is he supposed to do in case this event happens? Which is very critical in Indian environment because most of the time we don't have orders what to do if this incident happens. And then he responds. So this is a very effective way of doing it. So this, this is technology implemented by them. Thank you very much, sir. This is all I have to say. I think we've had uh, two excellent presentations and uh, it's clearly uh, educative for us to understand all the good work that has been undertaken already in this space. Uh, uh, we have time actually for three questions. So if you can ask a question and don't make a statement, and if ideally you say who you want the question to be answered by, then I can keep to time. Mr. Das Gupta, your hand was up first. Uh, my question is to Lieutenant Commander Solanki. It was heartening to know that you said India now ranks better as far as terrorism is concerned. We are less prone to terrorism. That's the good news. My question is gen on a general question on terrorism. In spite of all this methodology, the scientific way, preparedness that we do for saving ourselves against terrorist attack, the attacks do take place. So can you really predict a terrorist attack? Namely, can you really predict the site of the attack, the date of the attack, and the size of the attack? Is there any way you can really predict? I don't think so. Is there any answer to this? Because wherever the attack takes place, they're unprepared, in spite of our preparedness. And I think that will go on and on. It's something which is unpredictable. In fact, if the terrorists see this presentation, they will be ensuring that they will attack the other places. This is such a subject, you know, and that's what is happening all over the world. So would you like to respond to my question, please? Thank you very much, sir. It's a very interesting question. Uh, there's no one solution to it, but what we need to do is, is play at the national level. What we are doing is probably today is protecting our own house, own organizations. You know, we have to protect our border first, so the marine, marine side of the borders or the land side of the borders. Uh, government has taken a lot of good initiatives based on the, what U.S. homeland securities have developed in that country. So there's a national intelligence grid which has set up, so more intelligence will happen because what we need to do is start identifying each person in India because today the challenge is identity. So if they know I am just Beach Solanki, they know my account, they know my PAN card number, passport number, so they can track me if we can achieve that. I'm sure intel with those kind of intelligence, you can predict terrorism, you can identify those people who will conduct this kind of activity, start monitoring them, and, and then you can do it, sir. It's, it's not a big challenge, but you need to have a very systematic approach. And I think our government has started doing it. It'll take time. It'll not happen like America. It'll happen like India, sir. Next question, please. Happy situation. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I can only thank both our speakers for their very, very valuable presentations. Uh, um, I mean, there's ma various thoughts which are crossing each other's, all our minds in what else can be brought into play. But I think uh, both the chairman of the Airport Authorities Association and Lieutenant Commander Solanki have brought out uh, various uh, angles to this, this whole process of homeland security. It's a vast subject, as Mr. Pillay would only know too well. But ladies and gentlemen, please give them a good hand, and we'll get on with the next. Thank you very much.
have uh, 